So um, before I formally begin, there's just a couple of things I wanted to share about the program in general. One is that I'm planning to talk for about 45 minutes. And then um, besides stopping at least one time for questions and answers uh, during the presentation, we'll save time at the end. And um, I'll try really hard to stick to that 45 minutes, but Allison has assured me if we come to 11 o'clock and we're still not quite done, the, the Zoom webinar will continue, so we won't be cut off. Um, I wanted to share about the presentation that you will see many photos of caterpillars, and almost every photo was taken by me. Um, and almost every photo that you'll see was taken here in Washtenaw County. Um, a few friends from other states were maybe going to join in, um, but even for those folks, these should be caterpillars that um, are commonly found around your outdoor environments as well. And um, I actually cannot see all the names of the folks that are here. So in case there are uh, people watching that um, I've not met before, I did work as a naturalist for Washtenaw County Parks for a number of years. Um, and in my naturalist work, I always paid attention to caterpillars. I, I took many photos and um, would see them as beautiful or interesting, but I didn't really know that much about them in any great detail to the last couple of years. So I've studied a lot, read a lot of books. Um, I've used what I've learned to identify a lot of my photos. And it's kind of that uh, new learning and um, the ability to, to know what my photos are that's enabled me to put this presentation together. So yes, incredible caterpillars will learn about how different they are, how diverse their adaptations, things that help them survive more successfully, and a few other things as well. Um, and it's my hope that by the time our hour or so is done together that you'll be like me and be really quite amazed at these little creatures in our environment. So um, here we go. Oh, oh, sorry, my computer went to sleep. Oh, Allison, <laughs> see, I can't advance it. Uh, I might need Allison to come into the room here. Oh, is that, oh there we go, I got it, I got it by myself, okay. Sorry about that. So um, a good place to start is to talk about what is a caterpillar. I've met a person or two that they're holding something in their hand and it was a caterpillar, but they didn't recognize it as so. Um, caterpillars can look very different. So we're gonna talk about some features that make a caterpillar a caterpillar and, and just describe what it is. So caterpillars are insects, even though maybe in a lot of folks' minds, they, they don't quite, quite look like the insects they're used to thinking about. And then more specifically, caterpillars are the larval or immature stage of the moths and butterflies. And those are the insects in the order Lepidoptera. And I do know there's at least one little person, a child, and there might be more who are watching. So if you don't know that word larval or immature, what a caterpillar is, um, let me begin um, by saying all moths and butterflies begin their life as an egg. And then once that egg hatches, out comes the caterpillar. And a butterfly or a moth is a caterpillar um, until the time that it's uh, grown enough that it can turn into an adult. So it's not quite a good analogy, but the caterpillars like the childhood and teenage years um, for butterflies and moths. It's, it's how the, um, the growth happens before it's time to be an adult. Um, and that in itself is amazing to me. The creature that you see on the screen there will become a butterfly or a moth later. Um, in its life. So a little more science information about caterpillars. Um, caterpillars, like many insects, they have um, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Oops, didn't mean for that to happen. Um, they have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And um, I'm trying to find my cursor. There it is. So the red arrow is pointing to the head. Um, and sometimes in a caterpillar, it's hard to see the head, but it's in the front of the body. The blue arrow um, at the top is pointing to the thorax, so that's the part of the body right behind the head. And then the orange arrow is pointing to the abdomen of the caterpillar. And the abdomen is the largest part of the body of a caterpillar. On the thorax are three um, pairs of true legs. So these arrows, um, the black ones, um, the bug guide put as a help for identifying um, features on here. Those are the true legs. And the true legs are the legs that or the part of the body when that caterpillar does that amazing change, that metamorphosis 
changing from a caterpillar into a moth or a butterfly, the true legs on the caterpillar are what become the legs of the adult, and hence they named them true legs. Um, on the abdomen of caterpillars, there are typically five pairs of legs that are called prolegs, um, found on different parts of the abdomen, different sections. And the prolegs, when the caterpillar does that metamorphosis, the prolegs basically just disappear into the body. The tissues and cells become absorbed and, and don't function at all as, as any part of the um, a leg purpose in the adult. So, oops, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, oh, Allison, I might need your help. Uh, da, da, da. Allison's coming to my rescue and we're putting our masks on. Sorry about that. Well, can you uh, escape that for me? Thanks. All right, great, thanks. Sorry about that, everyone. So we're gonna practice um, what we just learned about the legs. Here's a picture of a caterpillar that I um, took a while back climbing on a plant. The purpose of those legs is to help the caterpillar move and to hold on to things. Um, and then if you look here at the yellow arrow, that shows you those three pair of true legs. And you can't really see the head of the caterpillar. There's some plant tissue in the way, but many times it's hard to tell the head from the back end of a caterpillar. So when you learn to recognize those three true legs close together, that can give you a clue that you'll know which is the front end and the back end of the caterpillar. Um, caterpillar bodies are divided into sections or segments. So the head is just one segment, the thorax is divided into three, and then the abdomen is divided into 10 sections. And so those prolegs typically on um, the caterpillars are sections A3, or I'll just say three, four, five, and six on the abdomen, and then on the, um, the lower, or the last segment, the segment 10. And sometimes these legs are called claspers. Um, and we'll learn a little bit of, more about prolegs in a bit. Um, when you're looking at caterpillars, often it's, it's hard to actually see the head. It is the smallest part of the body. And sometimes when humans are looking at caterpillars, the caterpillar uh, tries to hide its head or protect it. Um, so I actually have never seen a head <laughs> this close and I did not take this photo. Um, chances are when you're looking at caterpillars, you won't either, but I thought I would just show this photo and share that on the head of the caterpillar um, are their eyes. And most caterpillars have, um, I'm trying to find my cursor, they typically have 12 eyes, six on each side of the head. Um, the mandibles or the jaws for eating are um, here on the head of the caterpillar. Caterpillar have antennae. My cursor is on um, the one antennae on that caterpillar's right. Antennae are not up high on the head like they are on moths and butterflies, but down low on the lower part of the head. And then caterpillars have the ability to make silk. So the organ called a spinneret is on the head, um, much like the spinneret that spiders have. So again, though, um, you often don't get even a, a, a mild glimpse of the head of a caterpillar. Um, but they're quite interesting. Um, something that folks should learn about caterpillars if you're going to um, try to discover them and, and try to identify them um, is the fact that as they're growing, they shed their skin five or six times. Again, um, all caterpillars start their life as an egg. And then as the caterpillar um, has hatched, the, the first thing that we'll do is actually eat its eggshell and get nutrients that way. But then the job of the caterpillar from there on is to search for plant material um, and other types of food. Not all caterpillars necessarily eat just plants, but the job is to eat, 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 grow, grow, grow. And um, what happens for a caterpillar, its skin cannot expand as it's growing. So the skin has to be shed, uh, again, typically five or six times. And again, maybe for um, the younger people who might be listening, Pretend that you put on some clothes that are way too little for you. Um, you have on pants and a short or a jacket um, that you wore when you were much younger. It would feel so tight and uncomfortable. And that's what happens for caterpillars. Their skin gets too tight and their body um, receives a message by things called stretch receptors. And then what happens, the caterpillar has grown a new skin under the old and when it's ready to, um, to grow, uh, it will split the skin and the new caterpillar emerges. And then each caterpillar stage or larval stage between these molts is called an instar. So that's a really important word for people to learn. 
um, if you're wanting to study caterpillars because um, uh, it comes into play a lot for identification. And then if you look at this slide, these two caterpillars are of the same species, but the blue arrow is pointing to a caterpillar in an earlier instar, that might be instar number three, and then that purplish pink arrow is pointing to a, a caterpillar that's probably the last instar, the fifth or the sixth. And sometimes there's a special word for that called the ultimate instar. But just the most important thing is to remember that caterpillars can look very different as they're growing um, and making their way towards being an adult. Oops, let me go back one. So we've talked a lot about what is a caterpillar, but what isn't a caterpillar? Um, and this is a good thing to learn because you might find things in nature that could be confusing and you would go to your caterpillar identification book and try to find the creature that you found on your nature walk, but you just can't and it could can be frustrating, but it could be that it's not a caterpillar. So um, if you look at uh, the upper right corner and the lower left, um, where I put the little text box, these two creatures are actually the same species um, it just happens to be that they also can look different when um, they're younger versus when they're older in their larval stage. Um, I wanted you to notice the blue arrows on this creature um, and then together we can try to count the legs. So I'm going to try to use my cursor. We'll count the legs on the abdomen. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. If you hit six pairs of legs on the abdomen, of something that you wonder if it's a caterpillar, it's not a caterpillar. Um, butterflies and um, moths in their caterpillar form, um, I won't say never, never, but 99.9% .9 of the time, they won't have more than five pairs of legs. So these two creatures um, are pretty common where we live in Washington County. They're dogwood sawfly larva. And um, if you don't know um, what a sawfly is, it's a kind of small wasp. But, the sawflies are in the Hymenoptera order with um, the bees and wasps and hornets that we have um, in our nature. Um, this upper picture, the bigger one, um, is also a sawfly larva. This one, <clears throat> when I found it and took the photo, I looked and looked and looked for, I think, a couple of years trying to identify it. And it wasn't until I learned more about sawflies and realized this won't be in my caterpillar book. But if you look between the orange arrows, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Again, if you get to six pair of legs, you should just stop because it's not a caterpillar. Not, not that you can't try to find out what it is, um, but this one, I, I haven't yet discovered what species it is. And the last one, I don't know if many people would mix this up as a caterpillar, but it does have those three pairs of true legs. There's a head, it has a long abdomen, but if you notice where the white arrow is, there are no legs, and so this um, is not a caterpillar, and this is actually a beetle larva or a grub. So there are things out in nature you might find and you might think are caterpillars. So one more um, identification piece about uh, caterpillars. If, I did not take this photo by the way, um, this is from the web, and if you found a caterpillar and you were able to hold it, turn it upside down and look at it, at it, especially if you had some magnification like a hand lens, you would see on the bottom of those pro legs lots and lots of little tiny hooks or hooklets. And these are called crochets. And these are on the pro legs to help the caterpillar hold onto surfaces like twigs or plants. Or I don't know if you've ever had a caterpillar, if you ever let one crawl on your arm or your hand. Um, and I have a few times and um, had the experience of not um, being very happy with the pinchy feeling that was um, on my skin from the caterpillar. But when that happened to me, I didn't know what I was feeling, but um, in learning more about caterpillars, I realized, oh, it's those little uh, crochets that were digging into my skin. Um, so that was a fun thing for me to learn, to know why it's pinchy sometimes when they're walking on you. Um, soft fly larvae do not have crochets on their pro legs, so that would be another way you could figure out if you're looking at a caterpillar or a soft light. And um, sometimes scientists need to look carefully at these pro legs and they count how many there are, how many rows of them, and that sometimes helps them identify a species of caterpillar. But um, I've never done this personally, <laughs> turned a caterpillar upside down and looked at the pro legs, but sometimes it's necessary. So here's a chance to practice all that we've talked about so far um, for knowing if a caterpillar is a caterpillar. 
Um, I don't know if you can see my thumb is over here. Um, so this is a pretty small caterpillar, but look at the arrows that I put in there to help you. And do you think this is a true caterpillar or one of those things that um, kind of confuses us? And if you guessed a caterpillar, you were right. So these are the true legs um, at this first arrow. So again, three legs together and then a space with no legs tells you um, these are the true legs. So this is the head of the caterpillar. You know, sometimes it really is hard to tell which is the head and which is the rear. And then one, two, three, four, five pairs of pro legs. So definitely um, a true caterpillar that will become a butterfly or a moth. So we don't have time in our presentation today to talk much about metamorphosis. Um, someone um, more learned than I could give a, an hour long presentation just on that, but I wanted to mention um, just briefly um, about that amazing uh, process that happens with um, caterpillars. So this is a caterpillar of a butterfly. And again, it started its life as an egg. It ate and ate and grew and grew and shed its skin four or five times. And the um, getting ready for the last time to shed its skin, the caterpillar gets signals from its own body and that the caterpillar knows soon um, it's, it will be making, I'm talking like a caterpillar can think, but it does get signals um, that tells it to stop, eat, and to get ready for the next phase in its life cycle. And, and um, many, many people know that a caterpillar of a butterfly makes a chrysalis. So that's what we're seeing here. So as this caterpillar um, is as big as it will grow, um, what happens is it crawls up a plant or your lawn chair, or sometimes like the, the siding of someone's home, and it uses the silk from its spinneret and um, puts uh, down a, a fair amount of silk, and then it attaches a part of its body to the silk so it's anchored there tightly. And while the caterpillar is hanging there for the last time, it sheds its skin, oops, oh, sorry about that. Um, it sheds its skin and um, out comes the chrysalis. And if you look carefully, um, as soon as the chrysalis comes out, the eyes are already there from the adult butterfly. But you see this black, white, black, white, black, white, that's the antennae of the adult, the butterfly. Caterpillars don't have wings, but here's the edge of the wings. And um, here's showing the, the abdomen of the soon to be butterfly. And all of these things that are appearing begin to happen inside this caterpillar before it sheds its skin for the last time. So, so that metamorphosis um, really is such an amazing thing. And um, I already clicked it, but I'll show you again. This caterpillar um, and then this chrysalis when it, um, oh, I forget to say the chrysalis will um, break open its skin. So that's the last time for molting or skin shedding. And what comes out is this Baltimore checker spot. So um, the moth caterpillars do something, most of them a little bit differently. So this is the caterpillar of a moth up here. When it gets the signals from its body that growth is over, um, it stops eating. And it'll, um, this particular caterpillar will crawl up a tree, find a sturdy limb, and using silk from its spinneret will make a fairly large cocoon. And the caterpillar's inside this structure while it's making this cocoon. And then this caterpillar makes a second layer to its cocoon. Inside this, it's hard to show with slides, but Inside this, the caterpillar will um, start to make this smaller cocoon. And then when this is completed, the caterpillar is inside this smaller part. And again, remember, this is inside here and it sheds its skin one last time. And what emerges is um, this pupa. So this structure that you see that's kind of reddish and black is inside here. And then that's inside here. And this one, um, the pupa is ready to emerge, becomes a cecropia moth. And um, you can see these structures. Ron and I watched this structure um, up on a tree for, for months as we took some nature walks. And um, oop, it's changing on its own. Um, but sometimes it does take a long time, literally months, for the change to happen. Um, this is showing you just a simple cocoon. Um, I actually don't know what caterpillar made this cocoon, and I don't know what will emerge from it. But I just wanted to show you that um, there are simpler uh, cocoons than the one with the cecropia. And one more moth, you can see my um, finger in this picture. So this is a pretty big caterpillar, but again, it got the message, um, okay, it's time to stop growing, no more eating. Um, what this caterpillar did was drop off its plant down onto the soil, burrow down into the soil several inches, split its skin the last one last time, and um, 
this is what came out of that skin, this um, pupa of this particular moth. And um, it lives in the soil for, um, um, I truly can't remember, but a, a, a number of weeks at least, and maybe over winter. And then when it emerges, um, it's one of the sphinx moths. So um, to me, really one of the amazing things about caterpillars is these changes that they make to become their adults. So um, just real quickly, I'm gonna talk about things to look for if you want to identify caterpillars. And it, it certainly isn't necessary to identify them or learn the name of a caterpillar to appreciate how beautiful they are or how amazing um, their features are, but it can be fun to kind of work out that puzzle of um, noticing traits on the caterpillar and um, figuring out what they are. So a simple thing is just to notice what color they are. Is it one color mostly, two colors, three colors, but just pay attention to the colors on the body. And then besides the coloring, look for the pattern that um, you might notice on the body of a caterpillar. The first um, bullet there talks about camouflage, which many people are familiar with. Um, an animal is a color or sometimes a shape that helps it blend into the environment. Um, caterpillars have what's called mimicry um, as part of their pattern and that word simply means that the caterpillar is trying to look like something else and I'll show you some pictures in a minute and all these other words it's not important that you would leave this presentation and know all of them but but just know in those field guides for caterpillars um, they might talk about lines they might talk about bands um, this orange stripe is, is pointing to uh, excuse me this orange arrow is pointing to this red uh, stripe that goes the whole length of the caterpillar. Um, and then you can see lines of black going down the side, thinner bands of blue color on either side. Um, the word ring refers to colors that kind of go in a circle around the caterpillar's body. It's easy for us to think of spots. There, this arrow is pointing to white spots. But the main thing to realize is there are different features you can learn to um, recognize and use for identifying things. So this idea of mimicry, you're trying to look like something. So there are many butterfly species that their caterpillar looks like bird poop, like a bird dropping. So um, one of these is bird poop and one of these is a caterpillar. And um, probably you can guess, but here we'll go with the arrow showing you that this is the caterpillar. Um, but the coloration and even like the texture of the caterpillar looks a bit like the bird poop. And the idea is um, many, many, many birds eat caterpillars, but if you look like a bird's poop, chances are um, a bird won't come and eat you. <laughs> so that's the, the thought. If you, um, there's my cursor. If you look here, it's hard to see, but there's those three, tr three true legs. So this is the head of the caterpillar up here and this is the back end of it. So bird droppings are just one mimicry. Here's a caterpillar that it looks like it has giant eyes, but remember we learned that um, the eyes are very small and they're on the head. The coloration that you see these eye spots are um, on the thorax of this caterpillar. And the idea is that you'd look big and perhaps dangerous if a predator came to, if, if a, a bird, a predator of a caterpillar came to eat you and <clears throat> maybe that bird would fly away instead of take the chance. And then one last mimicry pattern. This is one of my favorites. Um, there are many twig caterpillars, the um, geometrid uh, moth caterpillars. So um, if you look in this photo, I think it's pretty easy to tell, but um, there is a caterpillar here. Um, the color looks like the part of the twig, little markings, the texture again. Um, these are one of my favorite kinds of caterpillars. It's so amazing how they look like a twig. So the arrow's pointing to an actual caterpillar trying to look like a part of the branch of a tree. Um, so besides <clears throat> the colors and the patterns on the body, notice the hairiness of a caterpillar. Some caterpillars have no hair um, or just a, a tiny bit. Um, some have long hairs like this one. Um, so the hairs are quite long, but they're thin. You can see the color of the body really easily on this one. Other caterpillars have really dense hair. This is um, like almost like a furry little creature here, um, but just thick hair covering the body. And then with hairiness, um, it's good to notice, are there any hair structures that you can um, use for identifying? These um, collected longer uh, pieces of hair are called pencils. So this caterpillar has three black pencils that would help with identification. And then I'll show you a picture in a little bit of a caterpillar with tufts. Um, so a little bit shorter, but still kind of 
collected um, hairs. Body features are good to notice, and again, not necessary to you know, think, oh, I have to remember all these, but just know that caterpillars have different structures on their body that make them um, unique or are particular to their, their family um, that they're a part of. So this orange arrow is pointing to, I have trouble finding my cursor. The orange arrow is pointing to structures that look like they would be horns, but um, these are just uh, little tentacles that are coming up. They're not the antennae as we learned. Um, the antennae are down low on the head. Um, this caterpillar, the black arrow, is pointing to a hump that's on the abdomen. You can practice again. There's those three true legs. And so here's the head up here. And so this is a, a, a raised section on the, the back end of the abdomen of this caterpillar. Some caterpillars have spines. That's what this red arrow is pointing to. Um, some caterpillars have little fleshy projections like tentacles or tubercles. So um, it's just good to get your eye trained to be looking for these sorts of things. Identification can um, be, uh, clues can come from behavior. Uh, let's look at this um, bottom one first. So some caterpillars, one thing you can note is a clue, these caterpillars are hanging out together. Some caterpillars do that um, throughout most of their life stages. Um, whereas some caterpillars, once they hatch out of the egg, they're always on their own, they're alone. Um, this is a type of caterpillar um, like the name below here in the text box that thrashes about if a predator, including um, a human, is coming uh, to disturb them. So the front end will wave and the back end will wave and the idea is to be a little more frightening, less easy to eat. And then um, sometimes some of these thrashers are also, um, pardon this word, but they're called barfers. And so they actually um, throw out food from their mouth as they're thrashing. And the idea is if um, a predator gets covered with this um, barfed material. Sometimes it smells bad. Um, that can be um, something that might save the life of the caterpillars here. And then also notice how a caterpillar moves. A lot of people are familiar with inchworms. And so um, this is an example of what people would call an incher or a looper. So if you look at the green arrow, this caterpillar has prolegs on its abdomen, but only two pair. And so that's a strong clue to what family this caterpillar would be in. Um, and you can eliminate a whole lot of other caterpillars that have those four pair. Um, here's the two legs. And when this caterpillar moves forward, this part of the body goes first and the caterpillar becomes straight. But when it brings up this rare abdomen end, it makes the loop here. Um, so if you notice how it moves, that can um, help you with identification. And finally, um, with size, um, this is my finger and this. Um, photo here, and here's one of those twig caterpillars. This caterpillar can fit on my nail really easily. This caterpillar, um, this is my partner Ron's finger, and um, if you stretch out this caterpillar, it would go past Ron's knuckle. So how big or how little our caterpillar is can be helpful. But I put this little comment in, oh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I keep bumping the laptop here. Um, most field guides, oh, I'm not sure why it's doing it at that time it happened without um, me touching anything. Most caterpillars or, or field guides only show you those last instars. So if you find a caterpillar that's little, um, you might not necessarily know is this just a small caterpillar and it's not going to get any bigger or is this one an early instar? Um, so, so sometimes size just isn't a huge help, especially when you're first learning about caterpillars. But this one um, by Ron's finger is so big it would be a good guess that it's one of the later instars. And then this last slide is a little bit of a chance for you to practice all these things we've just mentioned, looking at color and body pattern and all, but I, but I wanna show you something first with these purple arrows. Notice those circles that the arrows are pointing to. These are called spiracles, little pores. Um, all caterpillars have them for breathing, for respiration, but you can't see them very easily on a lot of caterpillars. But if you can see them, that can be a feature that you can use to help know what kind of caterpillar you're looking at. So you can take just a minute and um, again, practice the things that we talked about. Notice what's the main color of these two caterpillars. They're, they're cousins, I'll say, um, and, but they, and they are very similar. Um, so just kind of look with your, uh, your good nature observing eye, but you see mostly green as a color. Um, I'm gonna put more arrows on there. Both these caterpillars have a slanted white line going down the sides of the body, um, but there's something that the lower caterpillar has as a body pattern that the upper one doesn't. 
and this um, pinkish arrow is pointing to it, there's a white line below the spherical on this caterpillar. Um, so sometimes you, you do have to be looking carefully to be able to tell one species from another. And then um, some people, as you're looking, might have noticed the upper caterpillar has a red horn, um, and that's the back of the body. And then the lower caterpillar has a black horn. So you can you know, find as many clues as possible um, for identifying caterpillars. And these are the adult moths that these caterpillars will um, uh, metamorphose into. So um, I'm gonna take a, a little pause here to see if there are any questions. So Alton, I don't know if there are any that people have sent in. If so, you can um, share them and I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah, sure. We had a um, great question by Howard and I'm gonna read the question. And, and Howard, if you have any other questions or you wanna elaborate, just raise your hand and then I'll, I'll audio connect you to Faye. So Howard's question was, these caterpillars that you are showing seem slow, soft and defenseless as and as you say, changing their skins five to six times, why aren't they all picked off by birds and carnivore insects wiping out the species? Oh boy. Um, so I'm gonna um, just repeat what I think the question was. Caterpillars with their soft skin and they're, especially when they're um, molting, their skin is extra soft right after that. Why aren't so many caterpillars picked off by um, birds and other predators? Well, the answer is many, many, many caterpillars are picked off by various predators. I have slides towards the end that will show you some predators. Um, but there are, one answer is there are so many caterpillars in the world that um, it, it would be almost an un, unthinkable thing that they would all be eaten. Um, and some of the reasons for that, um, caterpillars have many types of protection. So some caterpillars have um, bad tasting chemicals that predators learn about. Um, some caterpillars um, do have those spiny, hairy bodies that help keep them safe um, even right after they um, are, are a new instar stage. Um, caterpillars have that ability to um, look scary at times and some caterpillars make noises, believe it or not. Um, not very many, but some do that can scare predators. Um, the, uh, caterpillars are really good at hiding. Many caterpillars feed more at night than in the day. So you're safer from predators if you don't come out from hiding until um, you're ready to eat. Some caterpillars actually make shelters out of plant material using their silk and they hide in those. Um, so someone could probably do a, an entire presentation just on the way caterpillars protect themselves. So I don't know if Howard wanted to type anything else, but Hopefully that answered your question at least a bit. I was just going to add, um, I didn't see anything else come from Howard, but if anybody wants to raise their hand or anything, we can connect you audio. And if you didn't want to type, they would be happy to, you know, answer the question directly. Okay. I don't see, let me hold on another. Howard, thanks you for your answer. Um, I don't see any other questions coming through, but we'll have time again at the end. So keep them and drop them here and we'll, we'll revisit if they show up. Okay, yep, great. Thank you, Allison. Okay, so I wanted to talk about how and where to find caterpillars. And the first thing I would say to people is just pay attention. I would guess if you're watching this, you're someone who just likes nature in general and you're already pretty, pretty good, I bet, at um, observing things but we just need a little more care because caterpillars are such small creatures. But anytime you take a walk, when you're in your garden, just anytime you're outside, caterpillars are in cities as long as there are some plants around. Um, caterpillars can be in really, um, you know, neighborhoods with lots of houses and people being very active. Of course, they're in um, forests and fields and also just pay attention. Um, some caterpillars eat only certain foods. And so as you're reading and learning about caterpillars, if you learn um, about the giant swallowtail, it feeds on only two of our um, native shrubs, then you could go and look for um, those shrubs and try to find those caterpillars. Um, uh, I put this picture in. This is a picture I took just last Sunday. This is a banded tussock moth. And um, 
I found this caterpillar just by paying attention. And I wanted to put that picture in. Uh, I, almost every day when I go for walks in the last two weeks, I see this caterpillar. So, um, and being a hairy caterpillar, um, I think they're more comfortable being um, out in the open. But, but again, just watching and, and looking as you're walking. Um, a thing that I learned recently is, is practice looking under leaves as you're walking, whether it's in the daytime or the nighttime. And speaking about nighttime, um, go outside with a flashlight and look for caterpillars. Um, or if you're lucky enough to have a UV light, use that. Oh my gosh, um, some nature centers and other organizations are doing nighttime walks on caterpillars and moths. And the UV light can make those caterpillars um, glow in the dark. So that could be um, maybe something you can look for next summer as a program you could attend. And then another way to find caterpillars, um, this is my partner, Ron, but you can use a sweep net to uh, sweep in grass and vegetation, or you can um, beat on bushes and trees with a white sheet under it. And um, those are two different ways to capture caterpillars. So Ron is sweeping in the left picture. Um, make sure you have a true sweep net. It's a net made with thicker material, not a butterfly's um, or butterfly capturing aerial net. Use one, um, let me go back and just show you. Uh, see how you can't see through that net. You know, get a net that's thicker so it won't um, get torn in the vegetation. But sweeping, it's like with a broom, you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then you spill your contents onto a white sheet or a white tablecloth. Um, and then um, beading, it sounds harsher than what it is, but Ron just took the handle of the net and um, with our cloth under a sumac near our house here, just tapping on the branch gently um, will cause caterpillars to drop and onto the, the white sheet. White's important because you can see things more easily. Um, and something that I read just lately, when you're ready to do any kind of beading, um, make sure you don't rustle the twig by mistake before you're, you're ready with your um, sheet underneath because it'll give the caterpillars a warning. Beading is almost like taking things, taking the caterpillar by surprise. And again, beading, you don't really hit hard, you just tap. I wish they would change that name. And then um, try to pay attention where your caterpillar came from. That's either easier with beading, but when you're done looking at the caterpillar, put it back in the tree or the shrub where it came from. Um, and when you're sweeping, you might not know what plant that caterpillar was on, but put it back in the, the very same area that you were sweeping just to let the caterpillars get um, back to the, the food source they might have been using. Looking for caterpillars, look for chewed leaves and or frass. Um, frass is just another word for caterpillar poop. And sometimes um, the frass to me is a better clue. Sometimes a caterpillar will chew on a leaf and then leave. Um, but if you can see the fresh frass or the poop, um, that you'll you'll be able to perhaps find something like this, one of our, our milkweed or um, our monarch caterpillars. Um, this is from my garden, and you can see on this leaf here some very fresh uh, caterpillar poop. So that actually was the clue that told me um, to be paying better attention in my garden. All those arrows are pointing to stems where a caterpillar ate all the leaf tissue off my tomato plant, and this was the caterpillar. Um, doing all the damage. And um, I put this picture in here just to remind me to tell you, um, yes, there are caterpillars that eat fruits of plants. Some caterpillars eat the flowers of plants. Some caterpillars eat fungus, um, mushrooms. Some caterpillars eat lichen. Some caterpillars munch on the poop of <laughs> bigger animals. Um, many caterpillars eat the leaves of um, all sorts of plants, but, but they can eat a variety of things depending on the species. Um, so when you're looking for caterpillars, um, you do need to be careful. This is a caterpillar um, that I had an encounter with when I, a long time ago when I lived in Ohio. I think this is the most beautiful caterpillar, beautiful green and that white and red stripe together. So I reached down and I picked up the caterpillar and immediately I went, ouch, I dropped it because um, the caterpillar, I actually didn't know what it had done to me, but I got stung by this caterpillar. Um, and this is one of the caterpillars that not only does it have pokey spines, but the spines have a toxin in them. Um, when the spine bumps your skin and sometimes literally breaks off in your skin, the chemical in the spine goes into our skin um, and causes a, a painful reaction. Um, some books say it's like getting stung by um, stinging nettle, but to me it, it hurt worse than that. Um, but you have to be careful um, 
that some caterpillars can be pretty harmful. And this is the beautiful caterpillar of the IO moth, which is also beautiful as an adult. And um, Ron saw one of these at the Leonard Preserve um, just a couple of weeks ago. So, so I, I guess a gentle reminder, um, I'm showing you pictures of things that live around where we do. Um, so there are caterpillars you want to be careful even without venom, sometimes hairs from caterpillars can irritate human skin, and some of us seem to be bothered more than others. Here's a little boy, um, he must have picked up a caterpillar and put his hand on his cheek or his ear, but you can see all the red inflamed areas. Um, so that holding a caterpillar, the hairs break off and, and just cause sometimes really intense irritation. Um, so do be careful of that. And um, this is a caterpillar where I can show you tussocks or tufts. Um, that we mentioned when we were talking about hairs. So look how tightly clustered these hairs are. Um, they're not as long as those pencils we learned about, but, um, but they're um, taller or, or higher than a lot of the hairs in the body. Um, this white marked tussock moth is a pretty common one. And I just learned this recently. These two red little dots that you see are glands that the caterpillar can um, uh, release uh, noxious chemicals from these glands that would help to um, possibly protect this caterpillar from a predator. So um, again, amazing, amazing things these caterpillars have. And then here's the head on this caterpillar. This head you can see pretty easily um, with the red color. So just quickly, um, I put North America's most famous caterpillar. This is the, the monarch caterpillar. And there's an adult um, feeding on the milkweed flowers. And then I put this slide in from a magazine. I apologize, it's a little bit blurry, but we talked about how instars can look different um, depending on the age of the caterpillar. But the monarchs are a species where from the time it hatches out of the egg, from the first instar to the last, the only way it looks different is in the size. So um, sometimes they don't look so different. Um, here's another caterpillar you can find on um, milkweed. And I'm thinking this caterpillar is more familiar to people now since we've been um, trying to, many people grow milkweed um, to help the monarch population. But this one is the milkweed tussock moth. Um, it has the bristles that you see on the back and then these kind of lovely colors of um, oh, an amber and then tan and then black hairs and then lots of pencils coming out um, from either end of the body. Um, and this caterpillar too, in all those instars, of, of course the size will change, but the coloration in the body pattern stays very similar. Um, this caterpillar I just wanted to um, point out to folks is one that gets people's attention a lot in the springtime. This is the Eastern tent caterpillar. Um, the caterpillars live together with their brothers and sisters, I might say, and they actually use the silk to make a, like a tent enclosure that they go inside um, when they're, um, they might have um, had an eating period, but then they go back to rest inside their tent. So they're not this pretty blue color um, in those early instars, but this is um, the, the color and pattern that they have when they're in the later instars. So again, this is a springtime caterpillar, but people notice from midsummer, late summer into fall, this structure made by caterpillars. And sometimes they blame this on the tent caterpillar, but this is a different species. This is the fall webworm. And um, they often make much bigger structures than that um, Eastern tent caterpillar does. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and the thing I wanted to point out, the fall webworm um, scientists and citizen scientists have pointed out that they um, can feed on over 400 different species of plants. There are the caterpillars that feed on only one type of plant or, or uh, maybe a small number, but some caterpillars have a, a big uh, diversity of food they can eat. Um, this is a caterpillar I found at a home in Ann Arbor, and you can't really tell, but it's this is the leaf of a tulip tree. But this is one of those caterpillars that we mentioned that has the eye spots for protection. And um, because I was trying to take this caterpillar's picture, what he's done is tucked his head down. This is part of his thorax, a plate that can serve to um, protect the head. And then if you disturb this caterpillar enough, what emerges are these special glands called osmeterium and the caterpillar will wave these glands. They look like antennae, but they're not. But um, again, a noxious chemical was released, a bad smelling chemical that's, the idea is to deter any predators that are coming. So, so again, amazing features for protection. And I wanted to point out, if you look carefully, look at all the silk that the caterpillar has put down on its leaves. 
uh, or on this leaf. And, and sometimes a caterpillar will lay down a layer of silk because it helps it hold on more easily, holding on to its own silk versus a slippery uh, surface of a leaf. And then this is um, the caterpillar of the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, um, a really common butterfly that we have. And um, this picture I put in just to show you, um, this is the American Dagger Moth, a very common caterpillar and from midsummer into fall. And just the tricky thing, the yellow caterpillar that you see is an earlier instar of this caterpillar, which um, in the later times of molting, it, it, it turns out um, having the white hairs on its body, not the yellow. Um, so there's all kinds of little things that can make identification hard. Um, and these two I put together because this American dagger moth and this caterpillar often are seen in the same time of year here in Washtenaw County. And if you look quickly, oh, it's mostly white with some black. I, I've known many people to confuse these, including myself. But um, look at the skinny pencils, the black pencils on the dagger moth. Um, this caterpillar doesn't have, excuse me, any pencils. I'll leave it there. Um, but this is the hickory tussock moth. So it has white pencils in the front and then some of those tufts or tucks tussocks in the middle. So um, just kind of pointing out, again, times when you need to um, be a little more uh, careful in your observations. So um, I wanted to show you just four of the books that I use. These two are my favorite, The Moths and Caterpillars of the North Woods by Jim Sogard. There's really good natural history information in that uh, Moths and Caterpillar book. But my favorite um, field guide to use is this Caterpillars of Eastern North America by David Wagner. Um, but both really good ones to use. And, and I would say also Wagner has excellent information in it. In Wagner's book, he has um, pictures of over 600 species of caterpillars. So it's, if you're gonna buy one field guide, I would recommend that you use that field guide unless you're just, just starting to learn about caterpillars and maybe feeling a little bit intimidated, then go ahead and get this P Peterson's first guide where the cover tells you there's 120 caterpillars in this. This is actually the first caterpillar field guide I use. Um, so it's a really good one to, um, and to get children if they're interested in caterpillars and um, wanting to learn how to identify them. The book on the left, The Owlet Caterpillars, this is a book you would only get maybe after you are into caterpillar um, learning a lot more. This is actually Ron's book. And this is a, a thick book, you can't really tell that, but um, it covers only the owlet moth caterpillars and um, has a, a lot more science information in it than some of those other books. But, but it's been helpful to me on a number of occasions. So there are really good books to use. Um, I put this picture in here just to remind you again, those field guides that you're using often um, only show you the last instar. So I've seen this caterpillar twice. Um, I have those yellow, or excuse me, blue arrows that show you some features. Um, the main color of this body is brown. It has these kind of little tubercles sticking up that are yellow. It's hard to see, but there's little warts on the back of the body. Um, these are the spiracles um, down on the side. And even though I looked carefully and noticed, um, I couldn't identify this caterpillar because it's a middle instar, and I didn't mean to click that so soon. But this, um, the University of Illinois photo there, is what it looks like in its last instar. Um, so it looks quite a bit different, but it took me a long, long time to identify this as an imperial moth caterpillar. Um, so just kind of pointing out, it can, it can be hard sometimes. Um, there are some websites that are really good to use, and. Um, we can put this as a slide that's up on the screen after the presentation if people want to copy things down. Um, but four really good websites I've used for identifying caterpillars. The fourth one, Bug Guide, is good for identifying um, all kinds of insects. So if you're not familiar with that, that's a really good one to check into. Um, apps on your phone. I personally don't use apps, but iNaturalist and associated with iNaturalist are the Seek apps, but I'm sure they would help you with caterpillar identification. Um, and then I just wanted to show you this Discover Life page. If you click on that and go on the internet, this is a really cool page because it gives you four things to choose from. You just um, click on the features that your unknown caterpillar um, fits in. You know, is your caterpillar brown? And does it have any um, spots on it? And then you would click on that. Does it have any tufts? And then does it have any spines? So however you click, um, over on the left, it will generate species choices for you, and, um, and it's a really good help for 
helping you narrow down the name of your caterpillar. And then I just have a few more slides quickly to, to show you. These are some of the caterpillars I've come across um, in my years of uh, being outside in Washtenaw County. Um, this is a fairly common caterpillar, uh, also seen often this time of year. And um, this is one of our, our work crews from the county wisely holding these caterpillars with his glove on. And notice that bright red among the black bristles. Um, and then, oops, the, oh, sorry, this is the giant leopard moth. Sorry, I forgot that was gonna come up. Um, this is another caterpillar that eats many things that the word polyphagus just means you eat many kinds of plants. And it eats things like tough oak leaves to dainty violets to what we call the weedy dandelions. Um, sometimes you see caterpillars on buildings. This one maybe was looking for a place to winter. Um, and this is the adult, such a stunning, stunning moth. And then notice um, that on top of the abdomen of this adult, um, that, that shiny blue that you see um, just makes it a, a really fun moth to have a chance to take a look at. Um, the arrow is pointing to a little caterpillar. It doesn't seem much like much there, but um, I love this, this picture. Like it's a little fuzzy, I apologize for that, but this is a spiny oak slug. Like it looks magical to me. Um, and it's hard to notice these oak slugs. I feel very fortunate that, um, that I was able to see that one um, and take its photo. Uh, but just uh, all different colors that make it beautiful and it looks kind of glistening. But this is one also with um, spines that could give you a, um, a painful um, jab, so to speak. Um, but, but just amazing, that creature to me. Um, this is called a yellow bear, a Virginian tiger moth. And sometimes people mix this up with the woolly bear. There's a, the woolly bear, maybe it rivals the monarch with a, a well-known um, caterpillar in, in our uh, culture, but um, woolly bears uh, are also in the tiger moth family. And um, they, a lot of people know the woolly bear, but they don't know the moth it turns into. This is it, it, Isabella tiger moth. But this is the time of year we see lots of woolly bears. They actually overwinter as a caterpillar. So they're kind of moving about looking for shelter. Um, this is an unusual one. Um, I love the markings that are on the head. And we looked at this in the, um, um, when we were talking about hairiness, but the hairs are really long, but really thin. Um, but this is a, um, a caterpillar called the laugher. Um, I found this one at Independence Lake. Um, this is a Catalpa sphinx moth. And um, we could do a whole presentation, or I couldn't, but someone could on the uh, parasitoids, um, the wasp and flies that lay their eggs inside a caterpillar's body, or sometimes on the outside, and those, um, when the eggs hatch of the flies or the wasp, they eat the tissue or the blood of the caterpillar, but the caterpillar is able to stay alive for quite a while um, until in this case, the larvae came out of the body of this caterpillar and they spun their own little cocoons um, waiting to emerge as an adult. Um, and what I was uh, reading about caterpillars, these parasitoids are um, even more of a threat to lives of caterpillars than than the birds. Um, there's a lot of things that attack caterpillars. Um, and this particular caterpillar eats only catalpa leaves. Um, so it makes it um, kind of interesting and maybe easy to find in certain years. These are called walnut caterpillars. Um, look at those pro legs that you could see. I'm sure this one would kind of pinch your skin if it was crawling on you. And this is just a slide to show you how many there are um, on this particular walnut branch. Um, smeared dagger moths are often found in wetlands. And um, I just wanted to show you these because both of these are later in stars, but look how different they can look. So again, there's challenges in identifying um, caterpillars. Um, this is a moth caterpillar that I found just this spring and just like so stunningly striking all those uh, features that it has, spines and speckles and um, little uh, uh, bands of color. Um, and this is one of the buck moth caterpillars. Uh, this caterpillar you might, start to find different places in the fall. The tent caterpillar is only a spring caterpillar and this striped garden caterpillar only comes in the later months of our growing season. Um, a beautiful color or color pattern with the black and brown and white and yellow. Um, and this is one that will be in pl uh, low plants like the goldenrods and asters and, and certain grasses. And um, look carefully in the branches of this oak tree and I bet you can find a couple caterpillars as you're looking. I'll give you just a moment. Um, but then look at the arrows that I put in. Every arrow is pointing to a caterpillar. And actually, there's more caterpillars I could have pointed to. 
And you might guess that this could be a problem for trees. Um, this is the area where I found all these caterpillars. This is at Hudson Mills and back a number of years ago, but this was a caterpillar that munched up all the leaves of these, most of these oak trees here. And um, some people are probably guessing, yes, that was the gypsy moth um, infestation that happened. Gypsy moth caterpillars, especially when they're older, are easy to identify with those rows of red dots or red spots and then blue on the top of their body. I'm gonna go back to this for a minute. If you go to Hudson Mills today, this area it looks perfectly fine and healthy. So it is true, caterpillars cause a lot of damage at times, um, sometimes to our agricultural crop, crops, sometimes to um, our trees in our yards and forests. Um, a lot of times though, in this case, since the gypsy moths just came one year, the trees were actually um, strong enough and healthy enough, the next year they were fine. Um, and it is true, again, caterpillars cause damage um, for our human interests, but the number of caterpillars that do that compared to the number of caterpillars that exist is very small. So kind of winding up, I'm um, talking about the importance of caterpillars. It's food for so many animals. This is a bird um, that's well known for eating caterpillars and not just any old caterpillars, but they eat those hairy ones. Um, this is a yellow-billed cuckoo sitting at the nest of an eastern tent caterpillar. And this bird has um, even special features, extra kind of whiskery bristles around its beak that helps it um, be less bothered by the hairs as it's eating. And here's a photo of um, four different bird species that are common here. Um, no matter what a bird eats as an adult, almost every bird feeds its young soft caterpillars because um, it's just easier for the baby's um, bodies, baby birds' bodies to digest. So. A chickadee on the top left, red-eyed vireo on the top right, eastern bluebird, and then a, um, a house wren on the bottom. And then not just birds, you might be surprised to know how many other creatures. That's a jumping spider eating a caterpillar, a chipmunk munching on a pretty big caterpillar, a frog uh, gobbling a big one, and there's um, a, a wasp munching on, um, or that might be a hornet, I'm not sure. I think it's a wasp, but munching on a caterpillar. Um, so many, many things eat um, the caterpillars. And then we could do a whole program on things that eat the butterflies and moths as food. And the last thing I wanted to mention about eating caterpillars, not in our country, people don't eat caterpillars. Um, I'm sure a few people do, but there are parts of the world where people eat caterpillars all the time and it's a real important source of protein. And so maybe that will happen in the United States someday. So I have, um, Lots of photos still of caterpillars that I've taken that I don't know what they are yet, but um, that's okay. Like it will be a fun thing to do in the winter and see if I can um, identify a few of my um, unknown photos. And so with that, um, I want to say uh, thank you so much for joining and um, invite you to go out and um, again, you don't have to know the names of caterpillars to enjoy. Um, looking at them, knowing about their beauty and those amazing adaptations. And um, I sure do feel amazed about them. So I hope maybe uh, after seeing this, you, you might feel a little amazed at them as well. So those thanks all the folks who have joined us. And um, we're close to 11, but um, we'll see if there are any questions now, Allison, thanks. Yeah, a few questions, they came in through the, um, through the type box here, or the, the Q and A box. Um, I had two, questions kind of in regards to guides. So I'm going to actually read you two questions because um, I think they're both really tied together okay. um, for you to answer. And then we do have a couple more. So I've got a couple coming through here. And if you guys are interested in asking a question directly to Faye, uh, again, just raise your hand and then we'll start working through everybody. Um, okay. And for those of you who aren't able to stay longer than 11, just as Faye said, thanks so much for joining today. And this um, webinar we are recording and we're going to look into putting on our YouTube channel. So if you're out collecting next year and you find one, you might also be able to add Faye's presentation to your resource list of how to identify. Um, and we'll, we can be in touch about that. Okay. Uh, so again, Faye, just as a reminder, I've got two questions that are really similar. So I'm going to pose them to you together. Um, from Deborah, can you recommend a reference guide for pictures of the in-star stages and then that was also um, asked similarly by Susan, who asked, do the guides have pictures of all the instars of each caterpillar? If not, why not? <laughs> um, let's see, this is my Wagner book. 
and um, so you, I don't know how well you can see it, um, but I can show you how thick it is. So in this book, this is my favorite one. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't others that you could use. This book sometimes has um, photos of other instars besides the last one, besides the ultimate one. Um, and sometimes in this book and also in other field guides, it, with verbiage, it will tell you about the other instars. Um, but I personally don't know of any that would show you all the um, instars of these um, various species. And I think the reason for that is it would be, I mean, you can see how big this one is. Um, if you had a book where you're showing all the instars, that it would, would be a pretty, um, pretty intense undertaking. Um, I bet one could have better luck trying to identify instars by using some of those websites that I mentioned. Again, that bug guide website um, is, is um, run by very experienced, knowledgeable people. So maybe going the website route would be a better one if you're trying to figure out from earlier in stars. So there could be a, a book uh, ID out there that shows in stars, but I don't know of any off the top of my head. If there's anyone watching who, who might know of one, you know, please share. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, sorry, okay, I was just answering a couple things. I've got another question that came through. Uh, oh, hold on. Sorry, clicking through. Um, Howard asks, are there any Ann Arbor sites you recommend for seeing a lot of different categories? For example, the ARB or MAFI? Um, and you mentioned, you mentioned backyards. Um, I think I think I would just say um, caterpillars can be um, almost anywhere. Oops, our phone is ringing here. Sorry about that. Um, so um, I would say just as I, I uh, mentioned this slide, um, just paying attention almost anywhere you go. Um, and then maybe this winter, uh, one could do reading and, and um, learn which caterpillars tend to be in trees. Um, versus ones that would be in the field like that striped garden caterpillar would be one that um, wouldn't be found in trees. But, but I really don't think you have to seek any special site to find caterpillars. Um, it's, it's a matter of just getting yourself outside and um, paying attention while you're there. Um, but again, doing that research, knowing what caterpillars might eat um, small numbers of plants and then going to find those plants could be beneficial. But, but any place where plants are growing um, and the plants are healthy, um, I think would be a, a good place. So we are so lucky where we live in Washtenaw County, we have so many natural areas between the city and our county um, parks and natural areas and, and not so far away are our state um, recreation areas. We are so lucky we have a lot of places for um, looking for things like caterpillars. So Howard, I didn't give you any specific uh, name of a place, but um, I think you could just pick places that you like in nature and you'll have some success, I feel, looking for caterpillars. We had another question from Tony. I'm just gonna write what she typed out. Um, Thank you, Faye, wonderful program and pics. By the way, I missed the name of the large black and white checkered moth, could you say? I think Tony's probably referring to the um, the giant leopard moth. And, um, and that's the moth that the caterpillar um, has those black bristly hairs, but it's red on the, the skin, the integument in between the bristles. So if I'm thinking of the wrong one, Tony, um, you can um, maybe type to Allison. But I think it was the giant leopard moth. And I did, we have seen those in our backyard, the giant, the moth itself. So um, Tony lives, I think if it's Tony that I'm thinking of, she lives not far from us. So yeah, it would be possible to see one in your yard <laughs> for sure. Um, and I just want to add a couple of questions. They come through about like the option to review this. And so it's, it's our hope um, to have this on the county YouTube channel. Um, so, and, and if we're able to do that, what I'll, what I'll do is kind of add that to, as a reference, maybe in the nat next naturalist email blast or just next, um, you know, program guide that comes out for Washtenaw County. So if this does become an online resource, we'll do our job to make sure that you guys who have come to watch this video know that it's back up there. 
Um, so it should, today's presentation, this whole presentation should be on YouTube um, through the Washtenaw County Parks and Recreation Commission channel. And then I am not seeing anyone with their hands up. So I really mm -hmm. hope that means that nobody has their hands <laughs> up. Um, but I think we've got, we have a lot of thanks coming in in the Q&A Bay. People, it looks like people really enjoyed this. So just to, to share with you. Um, but I don't see, oh, wait a minute, now I've got hands up. Okay, so I'm going <laughs> to invite you to talk with Bay, um, and I'm going to keep myself muted. I'm bringing in Linda. I'm, I'm just wondering if this program is going to be available, the recording of it. Uh, I have some grandchildren who really wanted to watch it but weren't able to be here at this time. Yeah, it might take me a little bit of a learning curve. I got to get it onto our YouTube channel so that that might, um, if you could wait a week, but you should probably, you should be able to see it on our YouTube channel shortly. Thank you. Okay, well again, thanks. Oh, I've got, hold on, sorry, sorry, Faye, not done yet. I've got, oh, wait a minute, that was one. Um, got one more hand raised from Linda, so I just sent a note to unmute if you're available. Okay. Well, thanks oh. everyone again for joining. Oh, and happy uh, caterpillar. I've got another one. Hold on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sending a note to Ron who's got oh. a question. Okay. Hi, Allison. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, yeah. I just sit, I just raised my hand when you asked Guy to be sure you could actually see it if somebody oh. did. And, but then I lowered it, so I would have thought you couldn't see it now. It's now lowered, so it works. Not lowered? Oh, it should be. That means that when I hit the lower my hand here, that doesn't work then. So, but. Okay, um, I've got, Ron, I've got, um, did you have a question, Ron? No, I just, what, I was just responding to your comment that you didn't know if it worked on your side <laughs> and raised my okay. hand. Thanks. I, I've got a question. Um, Susan has her hand raised. So I just sent her a note to unmute. I just wanted to thank Faye for the incredible pictures and all the information that she shared with us today. You're, you're welcome. Welcome. One of those caterpillars was from your house, Susie. <laughs> oh. But they, really, thank you, everyone. And um, I, not everyone maybe heard this was our first Zoom webinar, Allison and I. So uh, thanks for your patience for the little, uh, little glitches with me and <laughs> moving the photos back and forth, but um, thanks everyone for listening in. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, folks. If you enjoyed this, um, we're happy to know you enjoyed it and we appreciate the knowledge that Faye always brings to her programs. So I don't see any more hand raised. I see a few more, a few more thanks from folks just for a really nice presentation. Yeah, so I'll show this okay. to you, but I think well, we're set. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm gonna end this and we'll get this up um, hopefully on our YouTube channel shortly. Thank you all for joining. Thanks so much. Bye everyone.